Welcome to Books of Titans. I'm Jason Staples together with Eric Rostad, and this podcast is dedicated to the influences of influencers, the books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectual scientists, and others. And we'll talk about what makes these books so important and influential, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about these important works. Today, we're going to cover Iacocca, an autobiography by Lee Iacocca, a book focused on the life and times of Lee Iacocca. <laughs> <laughs> and his years at Ford and Chrysler, to finish, um, finish that read. How many times can we say Iacocca in one, one uh, sentence there? Um, I'm sure quite a few times. Uh, okay. Ramit Sethi is the one who uh, is uh, the recommender of this book uh, in Tools of Titans. Uh, he apparently reads this book every two years and has done so for 20 years, which uh, is to say quite a lot about this book. Uh, <laughs> you could probably say a little bit more about Ramit Sethi because uh, you did the uh, uh, did a little bit more of the research on this. I do know he's a personal financial financial advisor and wrote I Will Teach You to Be Rich, which is uh, a little bit of a bold title, uh, which he acknowledges. But uh, but hey. Fortune favors the bold, as uh, Iacocca would say. Yeah, and I've uh, I've come across him quite a few times on different podcasts. So he's a uh, he's a regular guest on on quite a few different podcasts that I listen to. Um, he also went to a, a small college in California called Stanford. He did undergrad and grad work at uh, at Stanford. So Lee Iacocca is the author of of the book Iacocca, an autobiography. It was written with William Novak, though. So, uh, so what that means is William Novak wrote the book. <laughs> he spoke. He spoke. Yeah, he did. Was, he did he interviews was... with William Novak, and then and then in full CEO fashion, William Novak uh, wrote the book. That's uh, you know wrote the book for him in his name. That's that's how these deals work. Which hey, that's fine. William Novak uh, hopefully got a good deal out of it. Yeah, and and I, th- I think you still get a pretty good feel of of his personality through the, through the writing of the book. I mean, it, it does come across as, as him speaking, even though, um, yeah, he didn't actually put the pen to paper. Well, I mean, that's, that's actually one of the, one of, one of the things that if you are a good editor or if you're a good, uh, good writer like this, uh, then ultimately the product that comes out shouldn't have your voice in it. It should be the other person's voice entirely. It's just you that has shaped it for for the page. And and I, I gotta say he's done a he's done a good job here because it sounds like Iacocca if you've ever heard the guy talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, brash brash perhaps. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Some uh especially after the uh, a similar similar voice I thought to uh uh suck up Oh yeah to Carvel and uh and uh Bagala from uh from uh buck up suck up buck up suck up and uh come back when you <clears throat> foul up um we, we just maintained our uh clean rating yeah yeah well so did they with their with their title but it was close anyway uh so as for Lee Iacocca uh anybody over the age of about probably 35 or 40 certainly would know this name very well uh because of his uh almost ever present uh, existence in the American media in the, in the eighties in particular, and the up through the early nineties household name, one of the few CEOs of a company that really truly became a household name, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, almost like a Steve jobs figure uh, in, in, in that time period uh, for what he did with, uh, particularly for what he did with, uh, with, with Chrysler, which is covered here. Uh, And, yeah, uh, the dude's still alive. He is 92 years old and still brash and feisty and all the other things that come across in this book. Still has plenty to say. Uh, and, you know, yeah, your, your note. <laughs> he's well, he's still, still kicking despite having driven Fords for, for that many years. Yeah, well, how about that? He's so. that that's a that's a remarkable thing too. Although he's got a big thing about there about in his in his book about how important it is to wear your seatbelts, people. Yep. And uh perhaps he's a he's a good example of that. 
So as far as this book, it was the best-selling nonfiction hardback book of 1984 and 1985. And he did he donated all the proceeds of the book sales to diabetes research, a disease that took his first wife. And he's still very involved in that in the uh, Iacocca Foundation, I believe it is, is, uh, is where he still does a lot of the, the diabetes research. Uh, his latest book was written in 2007. It's a book called Where Have All the Leaders Gone? And from what I was able to gather uh, from it, it, it appears to, to ask that question mainly on the political realm, where have all the political leaders gone? And so still very involved and uh, with, with speaking, speaking out and uh, giving his opinion. He even has a page on his website, uh, What I Believe. And uh, so we'll, we'll also see how uh, that perhaps impacted our, our current president, uh, some some very interesting connection points between Iacocca and Trump. Yeah, although so, unfortunately some of those don't seem to have penetrated the skin on some things. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. So uh, going into the next section of our favorite quotes, we uh, we both we we started out this podcast with with high aspirations of having <laughs> one quote each, and uh, now I'm I'm up to five for this one, and Jason's up to to about twenty eight. So. Uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, We'll go through and we may just start making this podcast into our favorite quotes and then uh, tying it back into the book. But uh, all joking aside, here's um, here are some of my my. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to go the uh, the old brain pickings, uh, you know, uh, quote ju- bu- jukebox, we uh, by the end of a couple of years of this podcast, we'll have our own quote ju- bu- jukebox out there uh, before too long because uh, we keep uh, storing up favorite quotes here. But yeah, yeah, so your favorite quotes here, favorite quote number one. <laughs> From Eric. Formal learning can teach you a great deal, but many of the essential skills in life are the ones you have to develop on your own. Nothing earth shattering here, but uh, I thought just very well well said. The second one is uh, when he was speaking about a job he had prior to the automobile industry, where he was a layout editor at a newspaper. He said, as the layout editor, I, I figured out pretty quickly that most people don't read the stories. Instead, they rely on the headlines and subheads. That means that whoever writes those has a heck of a lot of influence on people's perception of the news. And again, another another obvious quote, but this was written um, in the 80s, and, and you know, this is probably a job he had in the 50s or 60s. And uh, so, just a, a a neat thing, and especially I think this is probably tenfold these days. Uh, where, it was um, a job he had in the 40s, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was yeah. the early so 40s. Been, this is before he got with Ford, and you got to remember he was with the he was with Ford from basically just after the war on. So this is in the forties. So he's saying this. Yeah. And I think, you know, for today's day and age where it's, it's even easier to see headlines now on, on social media platforms and, and websites where, uh, well, Twitter, this is even more, more true. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. half the people, you know, half the intelligentsia gets their news from Twitter. I mean, I know I get a lot of my news from Twitter and, uh, <laughs> You're only getting 140 characters at once, so yeah. Good example with uh, with lots of stuff that's out there now. Where you know, actually, it's interesting. I won't get too deep into the weeds here, but you know, the, there was just a uh, a bit of a manifesto released by a, uh, a, a an employee at Google, and it's amazing the amount of of Twitter rage that this sparked. It was about gender and inc- inclusiveness and hiring and all this other stuff. And it's amazing how much outrage it sparks on the basis of a few headlines. I mean, you know, you get Gizmodo that releases, you know, something about, you know, Google employee releases uh, uh, screed about uh, about gender or whatever. And then everybody just freaks out and discusses how uneducated and sexist and, and all this this person was. And I wonder how many people actually read it. But they did uh, read the a couple source, of those Twitter headlines. <laughs> yeah, source material that 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 difficult thing to get through. Yeah, I actually went through and read it and was kind of surprised. I I uh, texted a uh, sociology a sociology professor uh, who's a, a good friend of mine uh, after I read it, and I said, "You have you read this?" And he's like, "No, no, I just actually read a, read an article about it by uh, by some of our colleagues where they had analyzed it." said, well, I haven't read anything about it by anybody else, really. But I, I went through and read it because people were, you know, t- people were upset about it. I went, th- went and read it. Quite frankly, 
that would have been a good MA level paper in terms of how well he used the research and how carefully he, you know, talked, discussed things like populations and, you know, differences and variances within populations and all this stuff. I mean, that would have been a, a good MA level paper. And uh, it turned out that one of the uh, one of one of the other it was an evolutionary by uh, evolutionary psychologist who was asked to comment on it said, well, paper, probably if I was being fair, would have gotten an A minus or better in my seminar. Wow. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, I, but the guy got fired and everybody got really upset about it because, uh, you know, once the tweets get out there and the headlines get written, it's over. There's nothing you can do. And that boy, that he, uh, Iacocca nailed that there from his experience in the 40s. I, yeah. I'm going to jump in because otherwise I'm going to talk forever on my quotes. <laughs> One quote that and he's so I love how uh, pithy he is at different points. And he's talking about, you know, the, the trade deficit that, that the U.S. was starting to develop at that time. And uh, he says, uh, question, what do you call a country that exports raw materials and imports finished goods like the U.S. was doing at the time and still continues to do in many senses? He says, answer, a colony. <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh hard to argue with so you know and that's a, it's exactly the kind of tone he had throughout uh i also i also couldn't resist uh another favorite was uh his discussion of when uh the chrysler minivan uh, was first being released uh, it's a, you know a, basically a car that they had innovated there had not been such a thing as a minivan prior and, and he says I loved what the engineers had done to the handling and the ride this car was really fun to drive that's right after Something. right after talking about even before the minivan came out connoisseur magazine selected it as one of the most beautiful cars ever designed yeah, that's that's what I think when I see a minivan. My college roommate and I had a uh, pact going, and I, I still haven't followed up on this, but in, in college we made a pact that uh, whoever got a minivan, or if someone someone was bold enough to get, actually get a minivan, the other person had full rights to to beat the crap out of that person. <laughs> and, uh, I, he got a minivan, and I, I still haven't. Uh, you, I still haven't, haven't done that. You still haven't do that, that, performed so. your role. I know. I, I feel like a bad friend, so uh, I'll get on that. Yeah, you might might want to do that. Although, you know, here's the thing. I, I actually I have nothing against minivans. I mean, I think they're 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 quality quality cars and in many cases you know, more functional than just about anything else out there, but uh in terms of being beautiful and, you know, especially fun to drive, uh, you know, I'm I'm a little bit less convinced. I wonder if the editor of the Connoisseur magazine at that time was was fired for that. <laughs> or if they if they banished that uh that uh magazine from their um their archive and i wonder how much uh there was a deal with ford for advertising after they did that is after they said that i'm sorry with chrysler for advertising uh to to write that is my question but you know yeah yeah again the seedier well, side of how the media works you know i and he talks a lot, a lot about that which was was pretty uh pretty entertaining uh one one part this is probably my favorite thing out of the book and I wasn't expecting to get this out of it, but I learned how to make a really good hamburger. <laughs> so yeah, this was actually one of my favorites. I only, I didn't put it on there only because it was on yours. Yeah. So while I Coco was at Ford, he, he worked directly under um, Henry Ford, the second who um, I Coco didn't have a whole lot of good things to say about him. Um, <laughs> mainly due to the fact that, that uh, Ford tried to ruin him and uh, fired him and, and all that. Uh, which, none of that stuff's on his Wikipedia page, by the way, uh, Henry Ford the second. So it's all, all pretty glowing of, over there at Wikipedia land for, uh, for Mr. Ford. It's a shock. But Henry, Henry Ford liked uh, the finer things in life and uh, was really upset that no one could make a good hamburger or as good of a hamburger as his chef. The chef now, keep in mind, this is, according to the book, they had a chef, basically a chef, a company chef for the executives and not just one. They had multiple people in that kitchen that were, you know, basically there to cook whatever uh, for the executives. It was a, you know, on call. And I, I, I don't remember offhand what the uh, what when once Iacocca ran the numbers for how much that cost. But it was something like, you know, in 
1960s dollars. It was something like $180 per executive per day that they were putting into into uh, into that food. So yeah, so they were doing that, and and Ford was upset that he couldn't get anybody at home to cook that meat or to cook a hamburger better than what he could get because what he'd do is he'd go to go to work and he'd use this fancy chef to to cook a hamburger. And he was upset that nobody else could cook a hamburger like that. And one, so one day Iacocca asked the chef <laughs> to explain how he made such a, a amazing hamburger. And here's where the quote begins. He went over to the fridge, took out an inch thick New York strip steak and dropped it into the grinder. Out came the ground meat, which Joe fashioned into a hamburger patty. Then he slapped it onto the grill. So that's how you make a, uh, a good hamburger. Apparently. Yeah. And what was the quote that went with that? Uh, I gotta, I gotta find this. Um, he, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, geez. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the whole section. Um, you could order anything you wanted in that room from, from oysters, Rockefeller to roast pheasant. Uh, <laughs> and the, the sentence above is the $104 a head. And this was 20 years ago. And now, you know, 40 or 50, 40 years ago, uh, you could order anything you wanted in that room from oysters, Rockefeller to roast pheasant. But, Henry's standard meal was a hamburger. Henry for the second, that is. He rarely ate anything else. One day at lunch, he turned to me and complained that his personal chef at home, who was earning something like 30 to 40 grand a year, couldn't even make a decent hamburger. <laughs> Furthermore, no restaurant he had ever been to could ever make a hamburger the way he liked it, the way it was prepared for him in the executive dining room. <laughs> I like to cook, so I was fascinated by Henry's complaint. I went into the kitchen to speak to Joe Bernardi, our Swiss Italian chef. Joe, I said, Henry really likes the way you make hamburgers. Could you show me how? Sure. But you have to be a great chef to do it right, so watch me carefully. And then he goes into the quote that I, I shared. And he said, any questions? He looked at me with half a smile and said, amazing what you can do, what you can cook up when you start with a $5 hunk of meat. <laughs> yeah, which is, uh, you know, obviously uh, inflation has driven that up a little bit. So, yeah, yeah, I, that's, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a great example of the kinds of stories that, that permeate this book. Yeah. All right. My turn here. Um, <laughs> I, this is this is his um, complaint about the old catch 22 in terms of how money works. He says, want a loan? Show us that you don't need it and then we'll give it to you. If you're rich, there's money in the bank. There's always plenty of credit. If you're rich, if there's money in the bank, there's always plenty of credit. But if you don't have the cash, then you can't get any. <laughs> Like, oh, that's great. Yeah, you know, oh, I need I need a loan right now. Oh, you need it? Mm. Sorry, you're going to have to come back once you don't need it. That's the way this works. <laughs> and again, that's, I mean, this goes, this insight goes back at least as far as Jesus, who said, you know, to the one who has, more will be given. Uh, but the one who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And unfortunately, that is the way the world works. And Iacocca, uh expresses his frustration about this uh himself uh yeah so we can uh we i suppose uh, you've got a you've got a couple others so hit hit a couple others of yours all right um I, i'll skip one of them and i'll go to, to my my last one here and, and part of part of the reason i liked this book a lot was uh just the variety of of topics and um we'll, we'll get into that a little a little deeper but uh, he does talk a lot about uh, some political issues, and, and one of them was was free trade, uh, political and, and economic issues. One of them was tr free trade. So this this quote deals with free trade. He says, as far as I can tell, free trade has been practiced only four times in all of history. One is in textbooks. The three real world pr practitioners were the Dutch, briefly, the English at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and the United States after World War II. And I, I like that quote because it, it you know it was, it was funny. One is in textbooks. Um, but also it reminded me of, of undergrad studying, studying international business and, and, uh, having that, that lecture one day where, well, let's, let's have the talk about free trade. Uh, first off, it, it doesn't exist. And second off, here's why. And, and, uh, going through that discussion, um, it, it was, it was pretty funny, but he, he really nails it here with, uh, we can talk all the time we want about free trade, but it, it just simply does not exist. Yeah, it and, doesn't exist. And that's part of his complaint, too, right, is that that yeah. that it ends up being used as a rhetorical device to 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 uh, 
limit who gets what. And he's saying, well, wait a second, if we're already regulating this and we're already, you know, pitching our lot in with this group over this group, then why is it, you know, how can we call it free trade to begin with? And if we're making decisions based on free trade, but then it's not free trade at the start, well, that's a problem. But we'll get to this, I guess, later in the show as we talk through some of his um, his insights there. I'm going to blaze through a few uh, additional quotes here. Uh, I, I really liked his his discussions about how to negotiate and how to, you know, and, and important things about, you know, learning how to be successful as, a, as an individual, some of these things. So I'm going I'm to bust through a couple of those. It brings up an important lesson for young people who may be reading this book. Always think in terms of the other person's interests. And he says, if you do that, then you're going to be you're going to be successful and you're going to be a good negotiator. The problem that that most people have is that everybody thinks about them, their own interests and doesn't really think in terms of the other person's interest and then as a result you get people that talk past each other and 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 things don't work. He says, but if you have the other person's interests in mind, you're going to be able to make contributions. You'll be able to negotiate. The products that you do will work because you're thinking ahead. You're thinking about what another person actually needs, what they want. And if you can meet that need, then there's money to be made. Very pithy, well, very, very, it works. And what's funny is, is uh, in grad school, I, I took a negotiation class and that was, that was pretty much the, the thesis of the entire course, uh, that, that one statement. And it's just funny because we spent the whole time talking about that. And, and um, this book was just chock full of, of those types of lessons where you, it's, it's memorable. It's, it's, uh, he presents it in, in a unique way. And uh, it, <laughs> I just kind of wish I'd read this book earlier <laughs> <laughs> and, not, and maybe not done uh, some of those classes. Yeah, well, I mean, again, it gets us back to one of our favorite parts of uh, Goodwill Hunting, which in... I think in both of our cases, it hits a little bit too close to home in terms of our uh, advanced degrees and uh, the value of them compared to a few uh, late fees at, at the public library. Uh, yeah. yeah. So anyhow, uh, another one. Um, the ability to concentrate and use your time well is everything if you want to succeed in business or almost anywhere else for that matter. And, and this actually goes with another the, the larger context of this was was really good in terms of uh, how he said as a as a kid, he'd learned to do his homework right after school so he could play after supper. And then in college, he would he he basically by the time he got to college, he could study without a radio or distraction. And he'd say, I'm going to give myself I'm going to give this my best shot for the next three hours. And when those three hours are up, I'll set this work aside and go to the movies. And he seems actually and, and this this came up, he says, you know, after, after the quote that I just mentioned, ever since college, I've worked hard during the week while trying to keep my weekends free for family and recreation. Except for periods of real crisis, I've never worked on Friday night, Saturday, or Sunday. And that's that, actually... That was, that was amazing. That's one me. of the most impressive things about his life, actually, reading this in his autobiography. He did a lot. He, the man was a, was a very successful businessman, a very successful executive, very successful in basically everything he touched. And the fact that he did it consistently on a five day week mm -hmm. while, while, while very carefully segmenting his time is, is staggering. And it, and it just goes to show that, that actually working longer, and this is one of the, one of the, one of the upshots of the book, working longer, isn't necessarily working better. Yeah. And his philosophy of, of running a company that way, of we're going to do good work. We're going to work the best we can while we're at it. And then we're, I want you to be off the clock. I want you to get off the clock. Yeah. That actually, that mentality, we need a lot more of that. And especially now yeah. in the smartphone era and the email era and the text era and all this where social media era, where, where you're, you're supposed to never be off the clock. You're supposed to always be accessible. This is a good, this book is a good, uh, uh, reminder that things don't have to work that way that it's a, that it's it's okay to turn your ringer off to not answer the phone over the course of the weekend and things will you know people will survive your business will survive and actually micromanaging it and trying to constantly keep everybody grinding all the time and on the clock all the time can actually it, it actually can do quite poorly which we see you know from some of the stuff at Ford uh in his examples so 
that's a good one. Well, and I thought, yeah, I, 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 that really stuck out to me as well. I on a on a related topic, I thought it was interesting that okay, so he's spending all that time at home, which for his position is a lot. You know, the, all, all the weekends and, and all that. So he's spending a lot of time with his with his wife and, and kids. After he was fired at Ford, his wife had a, was it a heart attack or a stroke? Yes, a stroke. Like it was a, a week or two after. So they were that connected. I mean, they had that good of a relationship, and she was so in tune to, to the stress of, of what he was going through that she, she t- took it on herself in a lot of ways. Like, she she had a heart attack from that. Uh, I, and that also stuck out to me that, they had that good of a relationship, but then that she, I mean, that she almost dealt with that same pain just because they were, they were so closely uh, tied together. Well, and she actually, I mean, she ultimately died in the pro like toward mm-hmm. the end of the Chrysler stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the Chrysler crisis and, and it just goes to show, I mean, they were a unit and you can see throughout the book, like how much they were tied together. And that's, that's, those are a couple examples, but yeah, I mean, you get the sense that without her, he probably doesn't become the man he de- he becomes. And at the mm-hmm. same point, even though he's doing his best to spend time with his family and all that, his work still has that level of impact on their stress levels and on their uh, their ability to to you know live well effectively. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm I'm going to bust into a couple more uh, quotes here. Uh, It was then that I was first struck by the idea of buying a bank. You could make more money on money than you could on cars, trucks, or tanks. (laughs) And, you know, this again, he, he, he has no love lost for the banking system throughout this book. And we'll Mm -hmm. get back to some of this a little bit later in the, in the, in the discussion, but you know, GM had its own, its own banking system, basically that, that provided loans and all this to dealers and then to customers and all this. What I didn't know until I read this book and then I ended up going and digging through, I didn't realize that I actually now have an account with GM's bank. Oh, wow. Ally Bank is what was once GM's banking system. And it was spun. It? I didn't even know. Yeah, it was spun off. And I think you've got an Ally account. Yeah. So both of us are are actually... GM customers, at least what once was part of the GM company, it's been spun off, but still connected in some way. Ally Bank is ultimately derived from what once was part of Alfred P. Sloan's big banking arm of the GM company. Wow. Yeah. Full circle. Yeah. I had no idea first until, until then. Yeah. 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 I had an Oldsmobile as my first one. So, you know, again, a GM, yeah. GM car as well. All right. Uh, In the end, all business operations can be reduced to three words, people, product and profits. People come first. Unless you've got a good team, you can't do much with the other two. I love that because, again, and and, and it gets to his philosophy. You have to start with good people. And you could see this when he went to Chrysler. He wasn't going to do it unless he could take his his best people with him, unless he could unless he was going to hire unless he was able to hire a number of people who'd been casualties over at Ford. And the most important guy was already over there, which was a big factor in him taking the job. So um, and and then he talked about actually finding the right people. And he said it was easier to locate. So it's easier to to find the, 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 the good people once you paired out the ones who were dragging the company down. And he says, you know, when he's talking about finding finding productive workers, finding the people that you want to actually work with, he says, and this, I love this one because it's something I've, I've talked to my wife about over the years. He says, I'm talking about people with fire in their eyes. You can practically tell they're good just by looking at them. And I know this gets into, you know, potential implicit biases and, and all this in terms of, uh, uh, you know, dangers about stereotypes and all this. But I've found this to be true so many times that there are certain people I don't have to spend more than like two or three minutes talking to this person. And sometimes you just have to watch them, like just look at them for, for a couple minutes. And you're like, that person's going to be successful. That person is high quality stuff because you look at it. And the way I've always said it to my wife is that's a person who's really awake. Now, yeah. you know, I, that, that's not the same, by the way, those of you who are out there, listeners, it's not the same as saying they're woke. 
What, but, but I'm like, this is a person who's really there. Like they're alive. They're in, they're, 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 they're fully present. And you can see like when they, when, when they interact and all this, there's that flash, that spark of light that you see in their eyes as they're thinking. And th th there's that quickness about them that you're like, okay, that person's going to be successful. Now, granted, you still have to have discipline and all these other things, but you put that together with that, that quality. And usually I find those things go together. Those people are going to be successful. And he, he went about finding those people and putting them in charge. And I think that's a big part of why he was successful. Well, and, and I, I love how he kind of closes off that, uh, that thought process in his typical brash way. With 25 of these guys, I could run the government of the United States. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, and, and that, that again goes back to, he doesn't think there are 25 of them in the government. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that's another one, uh, another, uh, and then a couple quick ones here. Mistakes are part of life. You can't avoid them. All you can hope is that they won't be too expensive and that you don't make the same mistake twice. That's a good one of the seven deadly sins. I'm absolutely convinced that greed is the worst. Huh. And again, this is a CEO of a major company you know, you're, 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 you're capitalist extraordinaire. And what does he say? This isn't, remember, this is written in the decade of Gordon Gecko, right? Yeah. Greed is good, right? And he's saying of the seven deadly sins, I am absolutely convinced that greed is the worst. And you could see this because of his, his Ford experiences. And he was of the belief that Henry Ford's commitment to luxury and living a certain lifestyle and, and his, essentially his greed is what, made Ford un unworkable and ultimately put Ford way behind. Whereas what he tried to do at Chrysler is to share you know, profit share in different ways to really push certain, certain things a different, uh, instead of going for greed, basically go for, th for the health of the company and putting out quality product. And he did well. So I, I, I think that's, that's a nice one. Um, yeah. But he, and, but he even identified greed in himself where, he was making nine seventy per year at Ford, and he just he couldn't stand that he wasn't over a million dollars a year. Oh yeah, I remember that. And he he talked about yeah he was a little ashamed of himself with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> another couple. Um, so many people have claimed to be the father of the Mustang that I wouldn't want to be seen in public with the mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's Iacocca in a in a nutshell. Um, all right. Uh, then it's a good thing. God doesn't let you look a year or two into the future, or you might be sorely tempted to shoot yourself. And man, is that true? <laughs> and then finally, and this one might be my favorite quote of the book. Really? If I had to choose one, it's probably this one. I discovered that people accept a lot of pain. So this is what he discovers in, in the crisis at Chrysler when Chrysler was going bankrupt and it looked like the company was going under and everybody had to basically sacrifice together. And what he did is he cut his salary to $1 and, you know, basically, uh, and, and again, that's somewhat symbolic, but, uh, but basically put himself on the line for the sake of his workers there and, and to make a statement that, you know, executives, we're not, you know, we're all in this with you as, as the common workers. And he discovered that they were willing to negotiate more with, with him as a result in, in part. And he, he said, I discovered that people accept a lot of pain. If everybody's going through the shoot together, if everybody is suffering equally, you can move a mountain. But the first time you find someone goofing off or not carrying his share of the load, the whole thing can come unraveled. And that is a really profound insight. And, you know, it connects well with uh, Nassim Taleb's uh, concept of skin in the game. That when everyone else understands that, that every other member of the team has skin in the game and stands to lose and is, and is, is putting everything on the table then people are willing to go to war together. People are willing to go to, go to, go to business together and, and put their work together. And, and this is you know, something with, with sports teams as well. When you see that, when everybody knows that everybody else is putting their best in, it works. But yeah. once you get that one knucklehead who's over there goofing off or you get the coach or the CEO or someone who's detached from it and doesn't have to tighten the belt like everybody else, Oh man, 
it's just not going to work. And this is well, what and I think that quotes that quotes a, a real jab against uh, Henry the Fourth Second the, uh, as well, because um, the whole book he talks about how okay, so Ford he's he's a child of the, I mean he's he's part of the the line of Ford. He's the CEO, and yet he never spends any of his own money. Any bottle of wine he drinks is on the company. Any food he eats is on the company. He won't ever spend any of his own money. And so there's none of that shared commitment with him. It's all about getting, 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 and, and none of the, uh, the, shared, the shared pain uh, that they probably should have been going through at that time where they, uh, they could have been doing a lot better in the market. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, as a, as a coach, uh, you know, doing, doing some of the coaching that I've done the last couple of years, I've found that that some of the stuff that I, that, that I've, you know, I've done this sort of naturally, but, uh, some, some of the, uh, the stuff that he's getting at here is, is very much along the lines of my philosophy. And I found that it works. You know, I make my, I make my kids do certain stuff in terms of, uh, my players do certain stuff in terms of, of uh, penalties and so on. So, you know, I have a rule partly because in, in, in the level of, of uh, American football that I coach, if you swear on the field, you can, you can get a uh, 15 yard penalty. If anybody in my group, if anybody in the position group I coach swears in practice and I hear it, everybody has to do an immediate bear crawl of like 50 yards. But the thing is what they've discovered is when they have to do penalty work, you know, whether they do bear crawls or run or whatever, I run them with them. I do the bear crawls with them. Wow. And I'm like, you know, you guys are making me do this. I hate it as much as you do. And everybody does it together, by the way. One guy does it, and the whole group has to do that. So yeah. before too long, you start getting guys policing themselves. Yeah. Before too long, you know, in, in last year when I was coaching quarterbacks, the rule in, in post con, post-practice conditioning was – if I beat my quarterback in a hundred meter in, in the in the hundred meter uh, hundred yard hundred meter depending on the day, but uh, in those sprints at the end of practice, if I won if I won one of them, if any of my quarterbacks lost one, then they'd have to run another one after everybody else was done. Hmm. And you know I'm I'm a little older than they are, but you know it gave me a little running to do. And then you know at the same point, uh, I won my share, <laughs> so they had to run some extra ones. It keeps so them accountable. Other coaches of, of the coaches for that team do that. No, nobody's or really d- nobody's them. really done that, that that sort of thing. It's it's something that I, I I'm I'm a little distinctive on. But uh, but you know, my wife has actually said this over. The, uh, you know, she made a comment uh, a, a a few months back about uh, some of the uh, the personal training stuff that I've done. And I, you know, when I'm when I'm training with people and they train with me, she's she said I'm continually amazed by how how much pain how much suffering you're willing to put yourself through just so that someone else can suffer with you. (laughs) Just, it's just in order for that other person to be able to suffer too. Like you'll put yourself through a ton of suffering just so someone else has to suffer also. (laughs) And the thing is, if you're willing to lead like that, people are willing to work with you and they'll actually do a lot more than they would have otherwise. Well, it's what sounds like the basis of uh, basic training. Yeah. Yeah. You suffer together with those people, and you are you are you are going to be be with those guys. You know, you're going to you suffer together, and you will you will fight together. Yeah. So I, I suppose it's a little late for us to call these initial reactions, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, we can get to a little bit of the big picture in terms of overview. Um, I know you, you know, th- I actually had a little bit harder time reading this book. Um, I know you, this is one of probably one of your favorites so far, from what I can tell. I had a little harder time reading it. I, I, I did. I, I this one took me a lot longer than some of the others that we've read so far. I mean, it is a longer book, but but it was not the easiest. Uh, it, like the 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 style of it, in some for some sense, it didn't run as quickly as as some as some do for me. But I still really in, I still really enjoyed it and felt like I got something out of it. So that's that's a plus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I mean, it wasn't like one of my favorites that we've done so far, but um, I did enjoy it. And when I was a kid, I, I, I loved cars. I, I knew what all of them were. I mean, just when we were driving down the road, I could I could identify every car. And I just haven't cared as much in the last 10, 15 years. I mean, my, my dad has always been into, car, in, into cars. And, and so 
as a kid, I, I always was. Um, but this book kind of helped spark that interest again and also seeing how the industry works and how he described the industry. And then he, he's talking about Ford. He's talking about Chrysler. He's talking about GM. He's talking about what the Japanese automakers are doing at that time. Uh, oddly, the German automakers don't get mentioned much in this book, which which is interesting now that uh, the Germans have such a, a large share of the, the market as well. Um, but it was just interesting to see the the whole the whole industry and see the behind the scenes on it. So I've, I've found myself since reading this book, and I, I read it back in, in February, but I've, I've seen myself uh, get just start paying more attention again to um, to what's going on in the, the auto industry, who's doing what, and uh, what the new cars are and that sort of thing. Um, and I I just well, going into this book though, I, I assumed it was just going to be another CEO book talking about management and how to lead people. But uh, this one was a lot different, and, and it's written in such a way where you, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about the auto industry, the balance between labor and management, uh, governmental assistance, inherited power, uh, in the case with, with Henry the Ford, Henry Ford II. <laughs> Henry uh, the Ford II. Henry the Ford. You, keep, you keep wanting to say that. He, I know. He's like a, a Scottish uh, knight or something. Henry the Ford. Uh, inherited uh, good, good economies, bad economies, oil crises. Um, just a, a ton of uh, ton of different things that come up, up in the book, uh, so it was it was neat in that sense. And then my my final initial initial reaction is I, I think I have a uh, an obviously flawed worldview on how companies work, and I guess things just kind of in my mind things just work together smoothly. And to see the insides of Ford and Chrysler in this book, and to see the utter chaos and incompetence was just startling that they could keep putting out cars that uh that they're they're actually still around um that was uh that just struck me for for uh for some reason that they were that that bad yeah well i mean and and Ford is, of course famous for one of the b- biggest miscalculations in history with the Edsel, which came right before uh Iacocca was was really high up in, in as an executive, but but yeah, serious um, <laughs> serious serious problems in in that, and you know it's interesting how once you get big enough and once you have enough money, you can you can be a pretty lousy company for a long long time, uh, mm-hmm. and especially once you have enough lobbyists in your favor, and this is something that Iacocca gets at in a few cases, where. Basically, once you're established enough, you can become too big to fail. And even though you're a lousy company and you're run by essentially robber barons, it may not matter because there's too many people who have an interest in maintaining the suckage. Suckage. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a a, a uh, technical term. Yeah, it's a technical term from from my father. Uh, he, he 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 likes that one. So uh, I think we can just go ahead and jump further into the uh, into the book itself. Uh, we're already getting into the into the longer edge of our uh, of our podcasting here, but um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating to see. It was fascinating for me to see a lot of the details of the car industry and just running that kind of business that I didn't realize uh, before reading this book. I mean, some stuff I kind of assumed, but. You know, I, I think you've got the, uh, the the note here of how the, uh, about the car product lifestyle, and I thought that was that was fascinating. Yeah, the life cycle of uh, being the three life cycle years yes. out. So, um, and and I saw this when I worked at Russell with the with apparel. I mean, you've you've got to you you obviously got to plan ahead to to order the fabric and and account for shipping time and and loading time and. Uh, quality control and all that, but uh, the car product life cycle is th- three to four years out. So if we're thinking about that here in August of, of 2017, that means car makers right now are thinking about their 2020 and 2021 lines. Not just thinking the about world, it, they're, fi- they're, they're actually finalizing they're, they're designs and designing. starting them. Yeah. How do, how do you know what somebody's going to like in three to four years? And that was one of the, the issues they, they brought up with uh, the oil crisis of 79. And um, they're getting grilled by, uh, by Congress on, why didn't you see this coming? And, and Iacocca would, would respond, well, why didn't Kissinger see it coming? Why didn't Carter see it coming? They had a lot better intel than I did, and they didn't see it coming either. Yeah. 
But just, you know, to, to when something like that happens, a major, major shift like that, where all of a sudden the lines were out the door for gas guzzlers before 79. And then, and then the oil, the oil embargo, uh, everyone wants smaller cars. Well, if you're planning three years out and you're looking and all you're seeing is people buying gas guzzlers to make a, a quick shift like that, uh, can't, can't really happen when you're, when you're having the plan three to four years out. Well, and, and, so just, and, you know, I would have initially said, you know, without thinking about it, if I thought about it more, more, more in detail, I would have, I would have probably gotten there, but my initial thought would have been, well, why not just, you know, of course you want to be producing some small cars and some big cars and so on. And then as the initial sales numbers come out or as you start to see that happening, well, why not just make more of the smaller cars as you go? But then you realize like, no, it takes months to make these cars. Uh, and you know, it'll, it'll take, you know, one car may be made in a, in a day or whatever. I don't know exactly how, how quick the process is now, but the bigger problem is in order to make a car, you have to completely change the factory, Mm -hmm. right? So you have to get your dies cast. You have to, to do all of this other stuff in order to actually make the car. So if you miscalculate and you say, Okay, this year we're forecasting that, you know, this many Ford Explorers are going to be wanted. And then it turns out that everybody just wants the Ford the the uh Ford Focus or, you know, oh, we're going to make a bunch of Chrysler Town and Countries this year and then everybody just wants the Chrysler 300 and you miscalculate, it's going to cost you millions of dollars to try to pivot you can't pivot when you're when you're dealing with major factory operations that that require a ton of machinery and you know very intricate designs that have to be done all you know all at once in order to make that change all of a sudden you're going to have to put that factory or that part of the factory on hold which is going to cost you millions change out all that gear which is going to cost you millions and then Get, get all that stuff done differently. I mean, it's it just takes so long to do, and that's well, part of why his th- their idea of going with the K car with the, the single platform that they basically used for all of the Chrysler cars at one point was so innovative and so brilliant is they could actually pivot because all they had to do was was uh, change a little bit of what they were putting on that platform to be able to um, to be able to pivot and, and sell what was needed to sell there. As it turns out, it still didn't manage to save Chrysler, which eventually uh, tanked again in in the two thousands. So you know, whatever. Well, and, and Banana Republic can get rid of their their clothes when they make a mistake on the style. They can get rid of their clothes in uh, a secondhand store. Chrysler has to still sell their cars through their dealership network. So now you've got a whole set of dealers who are angry at you for not predicting the market correctly. Uh, they have to somehow get rid of these cars for less price than what they could uh, a car that everybody wants. So that that part was really neat too, just to see how all of it was connected with the auto industry, with the the companies making the cars, where through the dealers that uh, that distribute and sell the cars. So a lot of moving pieces, and um, and Iacocca was huge on going to the dealerships and, and making sure everyone was happy there and, and then learning from the dealerships as well. I mean, these are the people talking with the, the end consumer every day. So getting, getting to know exactly what they're, um, what they're hearing from people on, on, on what they want. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of the more interesting things in terms of thinking about how to run that kind of business and what you need to uh, run that kind of business successfully in, in this book. Uh, well, and, espe- and, and especially now with with companies like Tesla coming along, where they're they're, they're trying to circumvent the dealership dealer yeah. thing, yeah. They're 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 shifting every or they're flipping everything on its head right now, and so it's a read about this whole structure set up with all the car companies right now, and then you've got this Tesla coming in, doing doing something very different. Uh, it's it's uh, it's pretty pretty interesting in that sense as well. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting to me about that is is again how Tesla is not allowed to sell cars in a number of states because of the dealer lobbies. Basically, yeah. the dealers are trying to keep that from becoming a possibility for these companies because the companies, of course, would be fine doing direct order on on all this, and then of course that that kills the dealership model, which 
is you know so critical has been so critical to the car industry from the beginning but you know Mo- Elon Musk is probably right that this is this is an area that's ripe for uh, for innovation and in order to benefit the consumer it's not clear that the dealership model is actually the best so yeah it's it, well, there's a lot in there a, in a complete detour here <laughs> uh, a friend of mine posted on on Instagram uh, a, a live video of him in ludicrous mode in a Tesla where you basically, I guess, probably go zero to, to 60 or more in uh, three seconds or, or close to that or under. And uh, I mean, they're just, it's three guys and, and he's got the camera on all three of them. And, and the guy hits the gas, not the gas pedal, but the pedal. And they just fly back into their seats and they're just screaming because it's just so exhilarating. Um, that is something I would like to experience before I die. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I remember uh, uh, my old roommate in college, one of my roommates in college uh, had a, uh, a four wheel drive. Uh, uh, Mitsub- it was a Eagle Talon, I believe, or Mitsubishi Eclipse. So the same, they were the same thing. Uh, they were based on the, mm-hmm. on, on the same platform uh, as one of those deals. And it was a four wheel drive deal that he had juiced pretty heavily. And when, when, when you hit the accelerator on that one, you definitely got sucked into the back of your seat and it still wasn't even close to the zero to 60 of a, of a Tesla now. So yeah. yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, well back, back to the book. Yeah. Uh, you, you want to share one of your, um, your, uh, let's, nitty gritty let, let's go items? ahead and let's go ahead and hit the bailout section, which I thought was fascinating okay. as well. And I, I had a bunch of things to say or to, to think about there. And I think, uh, I think, you know, you you have some initial thoughts in the, in our show notes, uh, in these behind the scene notes that we're working from that I think are worth uh, are worth going into. Yeah, and it's it's funny to to talk about these numbers now because the the uh, large part of the book was was dealing with the the Chrysler bailout, which was one point two billion, which compared to uh, today's bailout numbers is. Uh, is like having a penny in your pocket. So it's pretty funny to see the, the amounts, but that whole section on the bailout was, was very intriguing to me. And it, and it caused me to rethink some of my base assumptions about government assistance for companies. Um, yeah, I did with I me mean, too. Just on, on, on the, on the whole, I, I'm almost a hundred percent against them, but I, I, I would say this, this book and um, his description of how they needed the bailout and, and how they used it and then how they paid it back early. Um, it, it made me rethink it, and I, I, I would be more open to it. He had one quote that, uh, that I thought was was um, was neat. He, he said, in view of all this, you have to ask a philosophical question. By going to Congress, did we really violate the spirit of free enterprise? Or has our subsequent success actually helped free enterprise in this country? I don't think there's any doubt about the answer. Even some of our opponents from 1979 now concede that the Chrysler loan guarantees were a good idea. Yeah, that that got me as well. It was um, and and you know, because I, I tend to favor. I mean, I wish we were closer to a free enterprise system. Although I think you know, I'm 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 closer to Adam to you know, real Adam Smith, not the not the interpreted Adam Smith that we often get filtered in the sense of you know total laissez faire. I think we need strong, uh, government. Offici- officials, basically, we need a fish. We, we need referees or umpires to ensure that that things are, are going well. And I think there needs to be some level of redistribution built into a system uh, in order to make sure that ultimately all the resources, all the money and so on doesn't wind up in the hands of a few bankers at the end of uh, at the end of the process. You give it a few generations and, you know, loans are ultimately P, you know, P versus I, principal plus interest, or P, P plus I, principal plus interest is always bigger than P. And and so at some level, uh, the, those who are lending are always going to have their resources and, and such growing. Though, you know, again, you can grow the overall size of the pie. And so, yeah, p- the pieces may get bigger for some, but the pie itself grows. So, you know, that's, I fall, I fall on that side and I tend to fall on the idea of let the government referee but don't let it choose winners and losers and so you know with things like bailouts i tend to be more or less biased against them because it's one of those things if the company has been run so poorly as to need to be or as to be uh uh uh, in need of a bailout odds are 
it probably sh- you know you should go ahead and let the uh, the the laws of economics operate and you know let the fittest survive in that sense. That tends to be where I fall. This challenged that a little bit, and and yeah. uh, and in particular, it challenged it about certain kinds of companies. If anything, I think it reinforced my view of the uh, the TARP program and the banking bailouts from the uh, from from the uh, crisis of uh, of uh, from the, re- the you know the recession the the, the financial crisis of two thousand seven uh, and following. If anything. It reinforced my view that those bailouts, in most cases, or in the majority of the of, of the uh, of the cases, were mistakes. Yeah. Uh, and but at the same point, I think certain companies. I think he's got a really strong case, and I think the biggest uh, the biggest piece of this uh, for me was when he when he basically said, and I'll paraphrase for the lack of wanting to have to look this up. He said, "Listen." Chrysler got basically screwed over by certain advantageous governmental regulation elements to begin with that essentially were were instrumental in Chrysler tanking. Mm -hmm. Chrysler may not have ever needed a bailout had the government not been so heavily involved in that sector to begin with. But because the government was so heavily involved and Chrysler played certain things, certain ways to deal with the kinds of regula- regulatory influence that the government was already imposing into that space and then lost partly as a result of that, well, then this was not the result, you know, the Chrysler's failure was not the result of free enterprise to begin with. It was a result of government intervention. And at some point, is the government not responsible to step in and potentially alleviate that? Mm-hmm. Now, on the flip side, after the, uh, or, or during the during the Great Recession, after the financial crisis, Chrysler went under again and yeah. wound up being sort of divided up. And now it's owned by Fiat and, and you know, GM and Ford have also undergone major, uh, major uh, restructuring. And, and uh, you know, GM went through a major bankruptcy as well. So I, I don't know that that he's quite right that Chrysler's success validates his it validates the idea of, of, of bailouts being superior because we didn't see that kind of bailout the second time, and we wound up seeing some level of success in saving the parts of the company that were valuable in that way as well. So in some sense, it winds up being six in one hand, you know, half dozen in another. But uh, but I do think that his case for, uh, so it's not the success that really gets me, it's the, the case for all the people and the families and all this that are affected by these gigantic companies that actually make stuff that actually produce value in some way that those companies should, if anything, be given a little bit of extra benefit of the doubt because of all of the additional economic impact that they have by being jobs providers and all that. So it's hard because in some cases, you know, do you really want what happens when Kodak or, uh, you know, Polaroid? Start, Polaroid is 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 a recent you know bankruptcy where what happens when Polaroid just can't can't do anything anymore? Well, do you do you bail out Polaroid? I mean, at some point, you have to acknowledge that the that the world has changed and the market has changed, and people just don't need that kind of business anymore because smartphones exist and people are using different technology, and they just they 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 fell behind and in a, they're the victim more of innovation than anything else. Uh, that's a little different. And then I think the other piece, and this is where I, f- I found it fascinating, his complaints about the banking system and how that crony capitalist aspect works in Washington. He said, listen, we had, we, we had to go through hell to get, the, to get the, uh, the, the bailout that we got. And he said, but two little banks go under in Oklahoma. And this is a direct quote. Two little banks go under in Oklahoma and you have Paul Volcker yelling about a liquidity crisis and loosening the strings on money. But when Chrysler and International Harvester, two companies with almost a million jobs at stake, are going under, that's good old free enterprise at work. Not really. That's nothing but a double standard and totally unfair. And then he he goes further and says, I'm a great advocate of free enterprise, but that doesn't mean I live in the 19th century. The fact is that free enterprise no longer means exactly what it used to. And he makes the case that, you know, well, 
when the government's already intervening and when the government's already heavily regulating sectors in areas that require those companies to change the way that they do their business, well, then it's not free enterprise anymore. And now you have to, now once you have that, you have to acknowledge that you can't just make decisions on the basis of free enterprise alone. Uh, yeah. And then to me, I put that together with a section elsewhere that is, seemed also especially relevant when he says, uh, uh, you know, each month, uh, I believe this is in the final chapter, but each month and some new type of financial instrument is created for the express purpose of absorbing consumer purchasing power and enriching the brokerage houses. Looking back on this period of deep discount, the, uh, of deep discount this and zero coupon that, I can't help but think that never before in history has so much capital produced so little of lasting value. And that's his view of the banking system and of the financial sector. And I think he was already forecasting in, in certain parts of this book. He doesn't do it directly, but he's already kind of indicating this is going to result in some serious bust potential. And people mm -hmm. are going to lose their shirts because essentially going back to, you know, you can make a lot more on money than you can on making actual stuff. And that's an, that's an issue that we saw come out, you know, these financial instruments coming out that, that, you know, those chickens came home to roost in 2007. And again, what did he say would happen when, when financial, uh, entities would, would run into trouble? Oh, you know, the, the, immediately the, 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 uh, their, their cronies in Washington are going to cut them a check. And that's precisely what happened. And all that does is, is in my view, I, th that strengthened my view. This book strengthened my view of the, pr the problem of moral hazard in the financial sector uh, as much as anything. Although I, I still think that, you know, and I'm, we're probably getting a little overly political here, but um, at least I am. Uh, but, you know, I think that our methods of, you know, going through Dodd-Frank and these things of, oh, well, we just need to regulate more. The, the real problem that people don't think about there is that the more you regulate, and you see this in this book as well, the more regulations the government imposes on an industry, the more it favors the big players. And that was one of the issues with, with Chrysler's. Chrysler was the third place company. They were the third biggest and, you know, only a fraction, a small fraction of the size of somebody, somebody like GM. And GM could ho have whole divisions devoted towards meeting various government regulations, and they could they could handle the, the the cost of meeting those government regulations. Whereas Chrysler, which was much smaller, couldn't afford to do that. And then when the government would suddenly shift and pivot and say, "Oh, nope, you're going to have these requirements now," that cost for Chrysler was huge. GM could yeah. could afford it. Chrysler couldn't. And that's yeah. something people forget is, oh, we just need to more thoroughly regulate. Well, those bigger regula those greater regulations, those thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages of regulations now only mean that the bigger banks, the bigger institutions are favored because they're the ones that have the resources to actually meet those regulations, which then further stimulates the moral hazard problem in that they become too big to fail and now you wind up having to bail them out and all these other things. So I think we've gone about things very much the wrong way and how to fix some of these things. But I, I think he, th this book has a lot of things that are so, so on point and seems so, so fresh to uh, some of the problems we've been having uh, of late where, you know, he's got a lot of foresight there. Yeah. And, and one, again, one of the benefits of reading a book like this, uh, similar to a few of the other recent ones we've read, is that this one was written in the 80s, and like uh, Buck Up, Suck Up, it gives us an opportunity to see if uh, what they've written, what these authors have written, and what the things they've said, if they if they hold hold the test of time, and, and uh, we get to see that a lot of these in, in uh, Iacocca's book did. One, uh, one uh, chapter that I really enjoyed was the one about the Mustang. When I was 16, that was the, that was the car I wanted. That was my dream car. I got a model of the, of, uh, of the, the Mustang and, and put it together and, and, uh, enjoyed the model, but not the, uh, not the, the car. <laughs> so, um, but it was just really cool to read about the first Mustang being created and its immediate success. And I, I believe this is a quote that's attributed to that. Uh, we used to, what I called the Mona Lisa approach, a simple profile of a car in white, listing the price along with a simple line, the unexpected, 
when the product is right, you don't have to be a great marketer. And I, I can't remember if that one was about the Mustang or, or one of the other cars, but it, it holds true to the, to the Mustang. I mean, they said they, they had more people visit uh, the dealerships because of the Mustang than, than at any other point. And it just sold off the lots right away. And it hit across all sorts of demographics. So it was most popular with 31 year olds, but there was a huge group of people in their forties who were buying the Mustang and then putting a thousand dollars worth of upgrades into it. And so it's just a, a successful car all around when they really needed to have a successful car in their, in their lineup. Yeah. And they nailed it. I mean, the, 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 the Mustang continues to be, uh, an iconic car and those original Mustangs, especially, you know, just iconic cars and to do them on in the price range that they did them was, you know, was really, I think the most remarkable thing, uh, yeah. that they were able to produce a product that people really loved and that continues to be iconic and to do it in the range that they did. I, I, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, yeah. Other stuff there. I, mean, I, I think uh, a couple other things we can we can do before we wrap it. Uh, I, I liked his take on technology, uh, and, you know, where he and, and we'll get more into this when we di- when we discuss uh, uh, Drucker's uh, the effective executive, which if I remember is the next book. Uh, yep. But uh, he makes this statement that Drucker would completely agree with: the key to success is not information; it's people. And more specifically. If you're going to play together as a team, you've got to care for one another. You've got to love one another. And he talks about a, a meeting with Vince Lombardi about how about what separates good teams and, and winning teams, championship teams from others. And, and it's that factor as much as anything else, which gets into the shared suffering deal that he deal, that he brings up later in the book, uh, which, again, I think those things are really, really good in terms of management, as is you know another statement. Most managers are reluctant to let their people run with the ball. But you'd be a, you'd be surprised how fast an informed and motivated guy can run, and you know his his view of management was not this top down. You do this, and and you know you're operating in the dark. He really talks a lot about the importance of empowering your employees to make decisions themselves and to get them invested in the product and to get them invested in the company vision and to make sure that they understand that their feedback is is heard and all that. And as a result, you wind up being a more dynamic company and people, once they're invested in the product and in, invested in their work and it becomes a part of their own self-identity, they they work so much harder and so much more effi- effectively and so much more efficiently and you get stuff from them as well. And it helps uh, bring the, bring better direction to the, to the uh, executive level as well. But we'll cover more of that in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, the effective executive, but you know, he also had a number of unique business decisions as well that he made as a part of this kind of philosophy. Yeah. And he was, he's one of the first guys that had an in-house advertisement firm. Uh, He did that at Chrysler and he he talked about that a lot. And, and the, just being able to sit with the advertising firm on a regular basis and be involved in those discussions and not just let this, outside an advertising firm come up with everything and then and then go with it and just have his approval at the end but for them to really be partners in it for them to be in-house uh that would that uh, seemed to be a, a unique business decision at, at at that point in time and it seems to have had a really big impact and even where he tells he tells one story of coming up with an idea and he could just tell the the advertising guys were embarrassed because they're like that's a really good idea. And we should have come up with that. And you're paying us to come up with that. But we didn't. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he is, I good think, job. I think if nothing else, Iacocca is a master, uh, motivator and marketer more than anything else. And as a, re- and his success involves his ability to transmit his vision, uh, and get people to buy into his vision. That's both clients and, uh, uh, and and potential buyers of product and also people within his own company. And and you can see why when you read this. And, and again, it gets back to his focus was rarely on just making money. His focus was on the other, on the, on the soft parts of running the company. And as it turns out, those things wind up being really heavy uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, of their, of their impact. So, and one of the things that I really liked about this is he talks about how early on he'd learned a, a lesson from a prior manager of his who ended up becoming an executive of, uh, of Ford and then wound up working in the Kennedy administration. He said, 
uh, he had an idea, a proposal for, for, for something. And this guy said, okay, go home tonight and put your great idea on paper. If you can't do that, then you haven't really thought it out. And he said, it was a valuable lesson and I've followed his lead ever since. Whenever one of my people has an idea, I ask him to lay it out in writing. I don't want anybody to sell me on a plan just by the melodiousness of his voice or force of personality. You can't really afford, you really can't afford that. And again, it, it, learning how to boil your ideas down and, and get your vision in, a, in writing in a, t- in a way that's, that's tightly integrated and, and, and thoroughly thought out is, is really uh, really a critical lesson and, and that idea of, of being able to write it out and produce it in, in that form before you, before you do anything with it, I, I think is a great lesson because in my experience, if you can't write it, if you can't figure out how to write it, you don't really know it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you can talk, th- you can sort of talk BS, but once you put things on paper or try to put things on paper, a lot of those inadequ- a lot of the inadequacies in what you see really come out and and you find out really quickly whether or not you you have something once you start trying to put it on paper it can be a nightmare yeah one other one other thing you did uh, i mean when you think back to this time in the auto industry and, and in industry in general you 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 have that that picture in your mind of management versus labor and major fights in between and everyone holding on to what they can and not giving in and just, you know, every single decision being uh, a fight. And Iacocca, what, what he did is he put a labor representative on his board. And the way he described it is that that was a, a pretty uncommon thing to do at that time. But it, it had it had really important ramifications and, and successful, uh, a successful impact on, on the company. And, and it brought the two sides together and they were able to talk things through a lot more. And I, I liked that idea of, you know, if, if, it, if it's somebody that you want to represent, whether it's your, somebody you're working with or it's a, a customer group you want to, you want to have, if that, if that group is not represented in your leadership uh, or in this case on your board, then you, then you're not really serious about it. And he was serious about it. So he, he made it a point that a labor representative was on the board of his company just another wise thing to do. I mean, I, I just thought that a lot about Iacocca. He, not, not even just like, oh, that's smart strategically. It's just that that's a really wise thing that, that he did. Yeah. I, I, I mean, not much more to add to that in, in, in that, uh, in that area. I mean, I completely agree. I mean, and actually a lot of what we, what you see in this book is just straight up co- what should be common sense, but it's wisdom. Uh, in, mm-hmm. in handling a lot of this. Uh, I thought also it was interesting that he, when he talked about his kids, when they asked him what courses to take, he said, get a good liberal arts education, not because any of the details matter, but you've got to get a solid grounding in reading and writing. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're not going to be able to apply a lot of the other lessons in this book, which gets back to, you know, you got to be able to put it in writing. You got to be able to mm-hmm. have some vision. You got to be able to, to do some of those things. I, I, again, I, I found that really interesting, especially since I teach in the area of liberal liberal arts and liberal studies. So um, I think uh, we can sort of get into uh, the the last chapter, which I, I, I thought I agree with you uh, that this chapter, especially uh, the title uh, is strikingly interesting uh, given today. And, you know, the just before this chapter, he's talking about health insurance and uh, all sorts of things there. So we can roll that in here. But uh, <laughs> I did also agree that that final chapter was quite relevant. Yeah. Uh, title of the f- final chapter, Making America Great Again. Uh, Where have we heard, heard, that heard of before? that? Oh, gosh. Yeah. I know I heard that recently. Seems, seems, seems familiar. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, that's uh, what's on all of uh, Trump's hats and um, one of his, his, his main camp- campaign uh, slogans. And so <laughs> after seeing that, Seeing the uh, the title of that chapter, I, I I looked into it to see if uh, if uh, Iacocca and Trump were uh, were friends, and, and indeed they are. Uh, there you know, there's photos of them together in in, in one of Trump's uh, books. It might even be that his his main one on on uh, negotiation. The art of the deal. There's the art of the deal. There's a photo of him and him and Iacocca in, in that uh, together. So they obviously know each other, and and I'm, I'm sure. Um, Making America Great Again uh, was a, a topic they, they discussed. 
But um, yeah, the, the chapter just deals a lot with trade wars, currency manipulation. But the interesting thing is, is Ayakoka is writing this, so it's about Japan. And now a lot of the, the statements on that front are about China. So it, it was, it, I put in my notes, I, I felt like I was reading in Trump's playbook in a lot of ways in, the, in this last chapter. Yeah, I felt the same way, um, if only Trump's playbook was coherent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things but, that Trump has, has pulled from this, though. I, I think there's no question about that. Yeah, and, but the other interesting thing is, is Iacocca is not like some diehard uh, Republican or, or Democrat. I mean, he, he, he goes back and forth, and, and even um, since writing this book, uh, one thing I, I, I saw about him in, in just doing additional research on, on him as a person, he, he goes back and forth on who he, he um, promotes and who he votes for. Uh, one year it'll be a Republican, the next year it'll be a Democrat. And you even saw that with his writing just on ideas of, you know, he's a firm believer, believer in free enterprise, but he think there's, thinks there's a, a place where government can, can assist in that. Um, and so I, I thought it was a fair uh, example in, in, in some of it, just in, in terms of, of being able to, to, to see both sides of things. Um, but, but yeah, that, that uh, to, to read this book right after, uh, Trump became president and for that to be his, his statement and that to be the main, uh, the, the title of the last chapter and uh, having a whole chapter devoted to it. I, I, I didn't hear that anywhere else that people said, Hey, by the way, this is, um, this is in my book. Yeah. Book. I was surprised actually that, that we hadn't heard that connection made once I'd read the chapter and, and all that. I was like, Oh, wow. We really should have heard more about this going back into the election, but, uh, and didn't, we, we didn't hear any of it, but, uh, I did think that his discussion of health insurance and such and other benefits was was quite relevant and quite interesting. I mean, he he mentions when I came to Chrysler, I saw that Blue Cross Blue Shield had already become our largest supplier. They were actually billing us more than our suppliers of steel and rubber. Yeah, and keep and in mind he, this he is continues. in the this is in the late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, and he and he continues that that statement saying, then he thought about the the other people he was paying. Uh, in, in uh, even some of those suppliers, and he realized that a lot of the bills that he was paying them also went to their healthcare coverage. So in, in uh, he combined all the costs of, of what they were paying themselves as a company, and then um, what they were paying other companies. There's a, that's a pretty big, pretty hefty amount of that going to to healthcare. Yep. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I love the, uh, this, this point about, uh, the, and when he makes the, the, his solution proposal, he says the real nut of the problem is that there's no buyer seller relationship left in the delivery of medical goods and services. The attitude is always to let uncle Sam or uncle Lee pick up the tab. So what if you're charging me too much for the test or the surgery? I'm not paying for it. Yep. And of course, all the changes that we've tried to make in the uh, healthcare system, uh, in insurance, and all of this have neglected to uh, get to that solving that problem. Which, yeah. <laughs> Given that, uh, I think it's uh, it's we can come back to the big picture and um, and and start to wrap the show. Uh, one other thing, one other little detail that I, I didn't realize is uh, there's a really famous uh, hot dog stand in Allentown. Pennsylvania, uh, and there's another podcast, the, uh, the 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 solid verbal podcast. It's a college football podcast, which which brings this uh, brings this uh, uh, hot dog stand or hot dog uh, uh, shop up uh, pretty regularly because one of their uh, one of their co hosts is from Allentown. But um, but yeah, I had no idea that Yakos Hot Dogs was actually started by the Iacocca family uh, because you know, and and it got its name because the uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch people, when uh, Iacocca's father emigrated, uh, uh, when, when he immigrated into the United States, uh, he uh, those those people couldn't really pronounce Iacocca, so they just said Yako, and that became the uh, the name of the, the hot dog stand. So, uh, yeah, that was another little interesting thing that they had a little hot dog business and uh, and and little restaurant business going as well. Uh, Lee's, Lee's, uh, Lee Iacocca's name was Lido, and when he said his name Lido, people would laugh at him, so he he, uh, he changed it to Lee. So Yep, there you go. <laughs> Things are a little easier, I guess. But yeah, in, so, into the conclusions. 
Yeah, uh, my conclusion, I, I thought it was a really good book and, and ju just helping to understand multiple facets of business, labor, government, intervention, trade, corporate strategy, advertising, marketing, the automobile industry, how to make a really good hamburger and product design. So it just it's it's it wasn't like the top 10 management uh, things I learned about being a manager or being a CEO of, of two different companies. It didn't it didn't fit the, the normal vein of a, of a CIO, CEO book. Um, it, it, it covered a lot of different things. And it, and it actually helped me understand some of Trump's viewpoints, uh, especially that last chapter. And it challenged me in in a lot of different areas, especially in in terms of government bailouts, and um, you know, probably leading to to a more nuanced view than um, than just the the solid 100% no giving money to to companies in, in any circumstance. So, I thought it was a valuable book in in that sense, in a, an enjoyable book on uh, industry that is that is really really fascinating, and, and one that I'd never really took a, a deep look into. Yeah, I, I'm going to echo pretty much all of that. I, I thought uh, his, uh, the thing I got most out of this was, was, was probably in, in the realm of management and, uh, and marketing and how he, you know, just sort of the mindset of how someone who was so successful in those areas uh, thinks. And, you know, I, I thought his candor in those areas was, was really worth it, was worth the read. Uh, and then some of these other things in terms of his uh, his business uh, or his political uh, discussions as well, I thought were were worthwhile. Although I, I mean, I will say there are some things that I think when you read them, you know, we talked about a lot in the in the podcast about things that um, that uh, looked really prescient at the t uh, given when they were written. There's some other stuff in there that I think he he completely got wrong. Uh, he's really upset about, say, higher interest rates. And he says, well, if you lowered interest rates, we could if, if we lowered interest rates and ended this merger madness, we could get the money changers out of the temple of the national economy. We could get back to doing business the American way by reinvesting and competing instead of buying each other up. And by creating more jobs, the people could participate in our economic growth. Welfare costs for uh, local, state and federal governments would could, would come down and capital would begin to uh, accumulate and plants would expand again. If we would just lower interest rates, we'd that that would happen. Mm -hmm. Well, interest rates are basically at the zero bound or pretty close to it and have been for over a decade now. And we're getting more mergers now than we did even in his era when he's complaining about the, all these big, big mergers. So I do think it's important to point out that, that while he is very confident and, uh, and brash about how right his opinions are in some cases, history has shown that some of these things aren't quite quite right that you know raising that that the high interest rates were not the reason that these companies were acquiring one another uh that there that there have to be other factors in play or it would have stopped once the once the interest rates fell to the floor and it didn't stop it accelerated so um so that was interesting but 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 getting a chance to evaluate his statements in in some of those things is it was also interesting to me i, I agree with you it, it it got me to rethink uh some of how I consider bailouts and, and uh, government intervention in general. Uh, although, you know, again, it, in, in, in the more philosophical area, I think, you know, I, I still fall closer in line to where I did before, but in the practical sense, and, and I think I, Iacocca falls pretty close to that in terms of, well, you know, if a more free market would be better, all things, all things being equal. The problem is we're not starting from that point. And, and I think that's an important uh, takeaway as well. So uh, there's a lot to benefit from in this book. Uh, I, I, I don't know what, what more to say. I think it's a worthwhile read, though it may take, uh, if it took me a little while to read, it may take uh, some of you out there as well, maybe a little longer than some of these others. Uh, not sure what it was specifically about it, but it was not one that uh, I was able to just sit and plow through really, really quickly. Uh, but, but I do think it's a worthwhile read. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Before we get out of here, just a reminder, you can follow us along follow with, along with us at booksoftitans.com. That's where we have book reviews, uh, the reading list, the full reading list. So I, I got a list together of all the books that were recommended within the body of Tools of Titans, but then also the reading list that uh, we're doing this year of, of the 52 books from, from those suggested books in, in uh, Titans book. And uh, we're also on Twitter and Instagram. Um, 
a, a little more involved on, on Instagram, and both of those are at Books of Titans. If you haven't already done so, you can subs- subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, the Android Marketplace, and as of this week, we are also now on Stitcher, so you can find us there as well. If you're enjoying the podcast, please review. That helps us a ton. Uh, Especially if they're five-star five star yeah, ratings. Five star Effusive reviews. reviews help. Yeah, and, and tell, tell your friends about this. Um, I don't think it really matters if you've read the book or not. Uh, I, we cover a lot of what's in the book to where you probably get a good overview of it. So share along, uh, share it with your friends, share it with your family, and we'd, we'd, be, we'd be grateful. We'd also love to hear from you either on social or, or by email from the website on what you think of the podcast so far and, and um, any suggestions you have or, or ways you think that we can improve. Uh, we'll be back next week to discuss the next book, which is The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker, a business classic. On behalf of Jason Staples, I'm Eric Rostad, and this has been the Books of Titans podcast. Thanks for listening. Keep listening, keep improving, and keep it real. All right. I made this.